So we're here with John Braybender and Tom Fitzgerald, the Philadelphia Inquirer. John, uh, John's going to give us a little uh, preemptive information about what his talk today at the National Republican Leadership Conference um, panel on big data, but you're going to go opposite well, yeah. talk. Well, my, mine is titled, TV is dead, long live TV, which sounds paradoxical, I admit, but the truth is, TV as the box, which just gets a few channels sitting in your living room that everybody gets around Thursday night to watch appointment TV, is dead. But TV, when we think in terms of content that could show up anywhere, is expanding. I think I saw recently where 300 hours of new YouTube programming is put up every minute. I mean, the, the amount of content that is out there. So now, what's happened with big data, which is very simply throwing a lot of stuff into a big pot, stirring it up and you find insights you never would have without the computer power you have today with big data, gives you a lot of strategic things. But the real move now is the small data all the way down to the household level, and particularly in politics, where you can find out what their main interests are, what their issues are, and where they are viewing their content. Mm -hmm. So that now you can reach them a lot more efficiently. And, and I, as I like to say, digital is the great equalizer in campaigns, and we'll see that in the presidential campaigns. You don't have to be the one with $100 million being raised or more. Right. Because now you can go and take your case directly to people. And, and I think that's, that's an incredible tool for democracy in this country. So. Does it kind of mess with the economics of uh, media consultant business? Are you saying, can I not make as much money? Yes, yes, yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, In a good, way. the good news is campaigns still are going to raise whatever they're going to raise, and they're still going to spend whatever they're going to spend. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think anybody has ever gotten the office or ran for office saying, you know, I wasn't going to run, but if this is going to help John Brabender, I'm getting in this race. I mean, my, my job is not to see how much money I can make right. off a campaign. It's, and it's, it's not even to tell a candidate what to say to get elected. It's to find out what they truly believe, what their core values are, and effectively and efficiently distribute that message to voters. Right. You know, and, and that's what a, a good media consultant does. You know, the bad candidates sometimes want to be wound up and told what to say. The good candidates already know what they want to say. They just want to make sure as many people hear that message as possible. And that's, that's sort of my job. So where do you, how do you see this play out in local elections? You know, people always talk big, they talk presidential, but this could be really a helpful tool in a congressional race, a state house race. Yeah, because you can now go down to geographic levels. You can go to specific households. So if you're running for a state representative in, in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, it may be parts of a couple counties or just parts of one county or whatever. You can just pick off those households. Same thing with mobile. Now you can do geo mobile, which lets you go to just specific places that you want to send mobile messages to. So again, this makes it more efficient. This makes it that you don't always have to be the candidate with the most money that can run or win. And, and I think that's a great thing. Does it also make it more personal? Yeah, it, it makes it personal. And, and Again, where you got to be careful, sometimes I'm always afraid people are going to hear, oh, I know what you're saying. This household's going to hear one thing they want to hear, and this household's going to hear another thing they want to hear. The truth of the matter is, household A might care about completely different issues than household B, and that's how they're going to make their decisions. Well, then you should have a discussion with household A of where you stand on those particular issues. So, where do you, how do you see this play out in the presidential elections this year? Well, it's interesting because, you know, let's take the Republican side where, you know, we're not talking to the whole country. We're, we're not talking to the whole Republican Party. We're talking to Republican primary voters, which are just like on the Democrat side, the ones who show up for primaries are much more engaged. They're the much more to watch and be news oriented. They're much more to go online. They're much more to follow somebody on Twitter that is of their same uh, ideology and so forth. And so, you know, I, I do feel a little sorry. There's going to be this core group of people who's going to hear from what I would say is probably the strongest core group of candidates by one party in the history of this country. You got 12 to 13 very credible candidates running, all that are going to be very savvy when it comes to using digital marketing, and you're going to have a very finite number of people who are going to be hearing from them over and over again. But I want to ask you about that. You know, 
this is really is an interesting year for the Republicans. They have a very diverse uh, group. They have a very successful group of people that are running in their in their states. And you know, can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, it, my argument was if we could take our top eleven and debate their top eleven, uh, it, Vegas would set us as a two touchdown favorite. Uh, I, I mean, you know, you, as you see, you know, they're having trouble getting enough candidates into the race. One is obviously they see an inevitability with Hillary, but to be honest with you, that, that is symptomatic alone that they don't find quality candidates that can offer an opposing view to her in their own party, which they should. Whereas if you look at our campaigns, uh, we have governors, we have senators, we have business leaders, we have diversity. I mean, it, it, it really is a strong, and these are all accomplished people. They're multi-term in most cases, have been in, in the Senate for at least two terms, governor for at least a term and a half, you know, those type of things. Uh, and, and, I, and there's some diversion as far as messaging. They don't all agree on immigration. They don't all agree on Common Core. They don't all agree on, on, a, on a number of the issues, energy, and so, I think it's really important. This is why I think you've seen this just this week, for example, in, in South Carolina. They just, the leaders there just came out and said, look, let's include them all in debates. They, you know, they're all credible. They all have great messaging. Let's, let's make sure the debates are driving the poll numbers instead of the poll numbers right now driving who should be in the debates. You know, and I, I think Iowa did the same thing in New Hampshire and there's this big call now to say, let's celebrate the fact that Republicans have such a good group of people that are running. I think they're right. And you know our home state. Both of us are from all three of us. Oh, you know, you're from Michigan. We're not originally. Yeah. You came originally. to Pennsylvania to get better weather. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. showing, so showing I mean, my wisdom. with as many people in the race, is there a possibility that a Republican primary could actually be interesting this time in Pennsylvania? Uh, let's hope. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, as you know, the problem always is it seems like it's developed and finished before it oftentimes right. gets to Pennsylvania. I think the way it's set up is a lot different this time. By way of example, last time Iowa was won by Rick Santorum, I think with 27% of the vote. Someone's going to win it maybe this time with 18% of the vote. And all these states, you know, you're not there to get 50 plus one, you're there to get a certain number of delegates. But because there's so many credible candidates, there is every indication that it's going to go much longer with more qualified candidates going much longer, which means it very well may make it where Pennsylvania is not just important, it's critical. Right, and if you look at 2008, no one thought that, that Pennsylvania would be an important uh, state for the Democratic primary. It turned out that they spent six weeks there be because of um, how close that contest would be. Wouldn't that be great for the Republican Party in Pennsylvania if you know there were six weeks of campaigning in our state? Oh, I think so, uh, and, and especially again, Pennsylvania is very diverse in the sense that, as as we always say, and you know that in, in the West and the East and in the Central, completely different issue cores, things people want to talk about, how they feel, for example, about Marcella Shale in one part of the state is completely different than the other part of the state. Pennsylvania is a very large state. I think it's, it, it's a real shame if such an important contest doesn't come here with all the potential candidates coming here and spreading what they believe is going to change America for the better uh, in Pennsylvania, and I hope it happens. One final question. Our state, everyone says, you know, we're going to go Republican this year. Hasn't done it for 27 years. Yet, if you look at the down-ballot seats, there could be a very valid argument that the uh, Republicans could do well here. I mean, the Republicans have has won historic numbers in the state house, the state senate, and the, uh, it's the fourth largest um, delegation in the country. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? They even won in Philadelphia with Martina White, uh, first time in what, 25 years that a state house seat was won by a Republican in Philly. Well, as you say, the Republicans haven't won the presidential general election in Pennsylvania since 1988. But symptomatically, we're seeing a lot of things that are changing about Pennsylvania, that are giving Republicans more hope. I mean, we're seeing that in that Pat Toomey is, is ahead in the Senate race at this point, which is great. Uh, I also think you gotta factor one other thing in, and that's the Hillary Clinton factor. I think there is Clinton fatigue. I think there's a trust factor there that not just among Republicans, but also among Democrats in independents, uh, that they have some concerns with there. And I think that Pennsylvania is one of those states where you have a lot of, particularly Democrats in the middle and the West, who care, um, you know, they used to be called Reagan Democrats, where they vote Republican almost as much as they vote 
Democrat, but what they're looking for is someone who understands their core values and feel that someone's fighting and standing up for them. I'm not sure they look at Hillary Clinton as that person. Well, and it's interesting, too. You see their children having similar values um, in terms of their voting. Um, you know, the millennials did not go huge in 2014 for the Democrats. Well, and, and, and I would call them Pennsylvania values. Yeah. I mean, there's things that we do see here that we do value. Everything from gun ownership. I mean, you know, look, I think we're one of the only states that schools are closed the first day of hunting season. You know, that's part of our culture. Right. That's part of our value. Freedom of religion is hugely important in, in a state, state here. Energy, where people see now that because of Pennsylvania, America's becoming energy independent. Our manufacturers are becoming much more competitive because we're offering cheaper alternatives on energy. And it's also making it so that they can compete internationally, which is very important to see if we can't get some of those Americans' jobs back. So, uh, you know, Pennsylvania is a unique state. Their needs are much different. Their core values are much different. And I think it very well might play well for Republicans. Thanks so much, John. Thank you.